record and I believe we are recording. Okay. So welcome everybody to the Bio 66 Human Physiology Mid-Semester Workshop. Um, my name is Stacey Demertzis. I'm one of the peer tutors for the CHHS Student Success Center. Thank you for all coming out today. Um, you all can hear me just fine, correct? Let's just make sure before I start talking. Put in the chat if you can hear me all right. Yes, okay, thank you everybody. All right, so what is this workshop gonna cover? What is our goal for today? So as you all know, your lecture two exam is coming up shortly. And so what this workshop will do is it's gonna go through key concepts that are gonna help you prepare for the lecture two exam. And so as we review these key concepts, there's gonna be opportunities for you to engage with the material and test your knowledge um, via polling questions. And I will go over each polling question. And so this workshop is gonna go over the main points for the lecture two exam, not everything that will be on your exam will be covered in this workshop. So it's very important that you study your notes, you read the textbook, attend office hours if you have any specific questions, and of course, attend lecture. So along with the polling questions also, feel free to unmute yourself and speak, um, put anything in the chat that you would like. Um, as I go through the material, I'm gonna be asking you guys questions. We wanna make this workshop very interactive. So feel free to do that as we go along. So just so that we um, are all familiar with like how to use the polling feature, I want to ask you all just kind of like an icebreaker polling question. So for the, and this is just kind of like an intro of how my polling questions are going to work. So um, I will put a question on the screen. You'll have a chance to read it, think about your answer. I'll then open up the poll you will answer. They're all going to be multiple choice and then we'll go over the answers together. So um, my question for you all is what has been your favorite concept so far in Bio 66 that's going to appear on the lecture two exam? And I'm going to go ahead and open up the polling question. Can you all, or I'll see if you guys answer. All right, so all of you have voted. So we're going to end the poll. And also, about half of you have said sensory and muscular physiology. That's awesome. Sensory physiology is definitely one of my favorites, too. And if you're interested in learning more about sensory physiology, um, I recommend taking Biology 129 Neuroscience. It's like all sensory physiology, it's great. All right, well, thank you for participating in that icebreaker polling question. So let us um, get on with the material. So with lecture two exam, um, there's going to be some concepts within the nervous system that are going to be covered. In particular, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And so I understand that the nervous system um, was introduced prior to the lecture one exam and that you guys were tested on it. Um, but I, what I would like to do before we dive into those two divisions is the way I like to kind of review the nervous system is start from the top, you know, because the nervous system, as you can see, has many subdivisions. So when we want to find out more about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, Let's start from the top. So we have our nervous system, correct? We're going to have two main divisions. We're going to have our central nervous system, which are our brain and spinal cord, and we're going to have our peripheral nervous system, like our spinal nerves. Within the peripheral nervous system, this is where we're going to have our focus on, which is why I have these bolded in green to help us kind of guide our focus here. Within the peripheral nervous system, there's going to be two other subdivisions. We have the somatic nervous system, which is responsible for body movements, and we have the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for more 
automated involuntary movements. Now let's focus on the autonomic nervous system. Within these two, we have more subdivisions. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And oftentimes you're gonna see these phrases paired. So fight or flight is a phrase that's often paired with the sympathetic nervous system. And rest and digest is a phrase that's often paired with the parasympathetic nervous system. And so I wanna ask you all, feel free to unmute yourself, put it in the chat. Why are these phrases um, paired with these divisions of the nervous system? Why do we often say fight or flight when we're referring to the sympathetic nervous system or rest and digest when we're referring to the parasympathetic? Feel free to unmute, put it in the chat. So why is that? Why are these phrases typically paired? Anyone wants to just put an idea in the chat, go for it. Or you can unmute yourself. Hey, um, rest and digest is like, uh... Um, so fight or flight is like when you're past week the critical situation and then that's just like the kind of thing where you're um, um, well, I think you're cutting out a bit, but if I if I can kind of understand you, you're cutting out a little bit. Um but yes, you're on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you were cutting out a bit. Um, but from what I heard you say, absolutely correct. So sympathetic nervous system has to do with our body needing to do something, needing to spring into action. And the parasympathetic nervous system um, has to do with when our body is in a relaxed state and we're not responsible for any sort of urgent action. So absolutely correct. So let's go on to the next one. So let's look at the sympathetic nervous system a little bit more in depth. So as I said, let's start from a very high level. Let's start from the top. Where do we find the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? They're within the autonomic nervous system which is part of the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system has two subdivisions, somatic and autonomic. So the difference between somatic and autonomic is that um, somatic nervous system is really responsible for any type of voluntary movement of our body. Um, so if we decide to get up from our chair, go walk down the street, that is our somatic nervous system in action. The autonomic nervous system has to, yes, has to do with movements, but movements that are more internal and involuntary, such as, you know, the movement of food down our digestive system, we can't control that. And that is our autonomic nervous system in action. The way I like to remember it is autonomic kind of sounds like automatic. And so it's, it's automatic, we can't control it. So with the autonomic nervous system, we have, um, of course, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. And, you know, what is the, um, Ryan perfectly, you know, explained the difference between fight or flight and rest and digest, but what's the physiology behind that? How does that happen? Um, oh, and yes, to answer your question, Kayla, um, at, since it's being recorded, we will have access to rewatch it. I'm going to post a link to the YouTube channel where this will be uploaded after the workshop. Um, cause I noticed when I post it in the beginning and students come in, they miss it cause it's like earlier in the chat. Um, so the link, the link will be at the end and then, um, this will be posted to the YouTube channel and you guys can watch it as many times as you'd like. Um, so yes, thank you for, um, asking that. So as far as the physiology behind the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, um, there's many things that go on, but I want to just highlight two key things. Heart rate and digestive activity. 
So in the sympathetic nervous system, as Ryan pointed out, is when we, um, we need to do something, we're in danger or there's something urgent that needs to be done um, and our body needs to spring into action. It's gonna make sense that our heart rate is gonna be elevated. And in that moment of this fight or flight, we don't really need to be digesting food. We need to be focused on what's at hand. And so digestive activity is gonna decrease. The parasympathetic is the opposite. Heart rate is decreased and it allows that time for digestive activity to occur. So as you can see, there's an inverse relationship between the two. So I wanna ask you, feel free to unmute or um, put it in the chat. How would an increase in heart rate, how does that help with sympathetic move? How does an increase in heart rate help you um, like put your body into action emergently. How would it do that? Like think about what a fast heart rate does. Think about like blood and where it would go. Yeah, so I'm seeing in the chat here, increased heart rate directs blood flow to the muscle. Absolutely, that is absolutely correct. Yes, increased blood flow. Um, absolutely, so when we have um, an increased blood flow to our skeletal muscles, we're able to do those movements. And so the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite. We're gonna have, you know, blood is nourishment. We're gonna have increased blood flow um, in our digestive organs to allow for digestive activity. And because we're not having anything that we need to be doing at that moment. Perfect, absolutely. You guys are doing awesome. So let me go to the next slide. So I'm gonna open up um, another polling question. So what we know about the nervous system divisions, in particular, the autonomic, the somatic, parasympathetic, sympathetic. Um, and this is where, honestly, I would recommend um, just writing out these charts and really knowing the identification, the vocabulary behind it. I'm going to open up another polling question. My question for you is, what division of the nervous system is responsible for skeletal muscle movement? And what division of the nervous system is responsible for cardiac and smooth muscle movement? I'm going to go ahead and open up that poll. Um, let me open up poll number two. Okay, poll number two. So we have A, B, C, or D. And just a key here, SNS refers to the somatic nervous system, ANS refers to the autonomic nervous system. Give you guys an extra minute. Waiting on one more. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds and then I, I'll close the poll and we'll go over the answer. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Um, okay, so the answer is, is A. So the somatic nervous system is responsible for skeletal movement and the autonomic nervous system is responsible for cardiac and smooth muscle movement. And, and why is that? So when we think about, and we're gonna cover more of the uh, muscular system a little bit later, but when we think about, um, you know, skeletal muscle, it's under voluntary control. And when we think about cardiac and smooth muscle, it's under involuntary control. And so when we know that about these types of muscles and we understand that, okay, the somatic nervous system is responsible for voluntary movement and the autonomic nervous system is responsible for involuntary movement, we can pair those two together and we can make those connections. So that was question two. So that kind of concludes um, what I wanted to talk about and review with you as far as the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So let's move on to um, sensory physiology. So with sensory physiology, the overall picture 
Um, and, and I'll actually ask you, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. What, what is the goal of sensory physiology? Like what's the end goal with that? Like we have a sensation and, and what do we want? Do we wanna be able to like perceive it and recognize it? Where does the information go? Feel free to just put anything in the chat or unmute yourself. Give you all a couple more seconds. All right, well, so with sensory physiology, that was kind of a tough question. Sensory physiology, there's a fine line between sensation and perception. So sensation is um, like what we're experiencing, our five senses. And perception is where, when our brain recognizes that. We can't really sense something unless our brain is perceiving it. So with sensory physiology, um, it's pretty complex, but I like to break it down into three main steps. So we have things within our bodies called receptors. And here I have a list of um, a few examples of sensory receptors that are found within the body. When a receptor senses something, um, this is any type of sensory information from the environment, it can also be called a stimulus, uh, it's going to experience what we call a receptor potential. And that receptor potential is then going to transduce the sensory information by opening up ion channels. And if you remember from the first lecture exam, when you guys learned about um, action potentials, you know, there has to be a threshold. The stimulus or the sensory information has to be strong enough in order for an action potential to occur. So what I would like to ask you, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, I have for step number two, a sensory receptor is going to experience a receptor potential and transduce the sensory information. What do I mean by transduction? What's the definition of transduction? And I'll explain, you know, in terms of sensory physiology, what that means. But um, if someone wants to add, you know, what's a general definition of, of transduction? I see someone in the chat says change. Yeah, so absolutely, you're on the right track. So transduction is a change of one type of signal to a next. Um, I'm not sure in, in lab if you guys have covered this yet, but um, I remember when I took the class and I was in the lab, I learned the definition of transduction as, you know, a certain signal being changed into a different type. And I remember in lab, we talked about like, you know, we use electrodes and we, we change our biological signal to an electrical signal and we're able to, you know, monitor on the computer. In sensory physiology, transduction is the, the change from sensory um, information to neurological information. So when our sensory receptors are going to sense something, whether it's taste or smell or sight, um, in order for our brain to perceive it, that sensory information needs to become a neurological information. And how does it do that? It's going to send a signal to the brain. And in particular, and I have it highlighted here in green, it's going to send an afferent signal. And so what I would like to ask you guys, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Um, what, it, what do I mean by afferent signaling? What's the difference between, um, I know you've heard of like afferent versus efferent. What does afferent mean? We have afferent signaling. So what does that tell us? Like what, in which direction is that signal traveling to? I see in the chat, um, someone has put afferent is like a signal that goes towards the central nervous system. Absolutely. So 
A ferrant, the way I like to remember it is A arriving. The signal is arriving to the brain. Later, when we learn about muscular physiology, um, we're going to look at efferent signaling. And what efferent signaling is, I like to say E exiting, signal is exiting the brain and going out to the body. So we're focusing on sensory physiology right now. Um, absolutely, your guys' answers were correct. So afferent signaling is where you know, we're gonna have this sensation from an environmental factor. And the signal is gonna go from our body, you know, from our sensory receptors to our brains, afferent signaling. So let's um, use an example to talk about this. So let's talk about chemosensation, um, otherwise known as taste and smell, otherwise known as gustation and olfaction. Gustation is a fancy word for taste. Olfaction is a fancy word for smell. So let's look at this through an example. So when we um, think about, okay, how do we perceive taste? How do we taste things? Um, we first need to identify, okay, what are the receptor? What are the sensory receptors involved in taste? And in this case, it is what we call taste cells. They're also called taste receptor cells, if that helps you remember that it's a sensory receptor. And so in this case, it would really be helpful um, just to truly review the anatomy in this case. So we have our tongue. On our tongue, we have these little bumps called papillae. Within papillae, we have taste buds. And within taste buds, we have taste cells. And so what a taste cell will do is when it comes in contact with a taste, with this piece of sensory information, it is going to go through, as we talk about the membrane potential, it's gonna then send this signal through a sensory neuron. And this is where this transduction is happening. We're having a sensory information turn into a neurological information. And what that sensory neuron is gonna do is it's gonna then send that signal to the brain so that we can perceive it, so that we can recognize what it is that we are tasting. And so with taste in particular, um, there are five different types of taste categories and I have them listed here. Salt, sour, bittersweet, umami. Umami basically means um, like savory. With these five um, taste categories, there's a certain um, factor that enables that taste that we experience. So with salt in particular, it's the sodium ions. With sour in particular, it's the hydrogen protons. With bittersweet umami, it's a little bit different. Um, it's any type of taste factor, like for example, like an amino acid. And it goes through a little bit more steps. Um, for example, like G protein receptors and second messengers. The lecture goes into more in depth with that and I would refer you to review those slides. But the reason I have this listed here is one, so that we can review the five different taste categories, but also to realize that what is the end the end goal here. The end goal is to deliver this signal to a sensory neuron so that that signal can be delivered to the brain so that we can perceive it. So that's how sensory physiology works as far as taste. So let's look really quickly at smell. So with smell, when we smell something, um, oftentimes like particles that we smell are called odorants, they enter our nasal cavity. And within the nasal cavity, we have some um, like epithelial tissue. And then within the epithelial tissue, we have olfactory sensory neurons. And if you see right here, the cilia, cilia is another word for hair. Um, and we can see it's kind of similar to like the taste hairs within the taste cells. Basically they're going to kind of grasp and receive that sensory information. And so what happens here is that the sensory information is going to be received by the olfactory sensory neurons. And as we can see in this picture, they're going to synapse onto the olfactory tract. And the signal, you guessed it, is an afferent signal to the brain so that we can perceive and recognize what it is that we are smelling. So that's just an example of how sensory physiology works with taste and with smell. So I have... Um, we're still in sensory physiology, but before we move on into the next um, segment within that, I have a polling question for you. It's more of a vocabulary polling question. So I wanna ask you, what is the vestibular system responsible for? And what is the auditory system responsible for? 
I'm gonna go ahead and release that poll. This is poll number three, vocabulary. Take a minute to think and submit your answer. Just waiting on a few more, I'll give you guys another minute. Few more seconds. If anyone hasn't voted yet, please do. And we'll be going over the answer um, after as well. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Thank you all for submitting your answers. All right. So the answer was C. So the vestibular system is responsible um, for balance and the auditory um, system is responsible for hearing. So we're gonna soon look at, you know, which organs are responsible for functioning each system. And this is where, you know, having a strong foundation in anatomy helps reviewing the um, images and lecture, the images in the textbook, any images in the lab protocols or the labs themselves to really understand kind of where this is happening in the body, but then also understand how it works, what certain structures, how they function in order to produce our, you know, balance or produce our hearing. So I have um, another question for you all. So we, we just identified the difference between the vestibular system and the um, auditory system. And so why might we get confused between the two? And it has to do with where they're located. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch poll number four. Identification. So why might, why might we get confused between the two systems? Give you guys about another minute. A few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end. Oh, all right. Thank you to everyone who voted. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So absolutely, the answer um, is C. So the vestibular system and the auditory system, they're both located in the ears. So that might be why um, it's easy to get confused between the two, because even though they have um, different responsibilities, different functions, they're located um, within the same region. So let's talk a little bit about the vestibular system and the auditory system. So. We'll start with the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is responsible for maintaining balance. And so in sensory physiology, you know, we talked about receptors receiving information. So anytime we move, whether it's linear acceleration, which could be bending down, jumping up and down, or angular acceleration, any kind of rotation of the head, there's gonna be structures within our inner ear that are going to sense that. And so in the vestibular system, we have the um, saccule and the utricle, and then we also have the semicircular canals, and they are responsible for either linear or angu angular acceleration. Um, I'll get into hair cells in a moment, but real quick, I wanna jump into auditory system. Um, that way we can talk about the hair cells in both. So with the auditory system, as you all um, answered correctly, is that it's responsible for hearing. And so sound is um, basically vibration. And so when we have this vibration, um, we have this movement of the auditory structures and this movement is going to then um, produce an action potential. 
And so here's where, as we talked about with taste and smell and in the three steps of sensory physiology, here's where when, when we got into, um, you know, what happens after it's received. So we have um, hair cells in the vestibular system. We have hair cells in the auditory system. And these are like our receptor cells. And so what happens is whenever they're bent, they stimulate a sensory neuron, which um, causes an action potential. And the signal can then reach to the brain. We talk about afferent signaling and how that allows us to perceive. So um, with the auditory system, with the steps of audition, oh, sorry. With the steps of um, audition, I would recommend, again, really knowing your anatomy, um, looking at diagrams, being able to label them. And so um, basically the, the pathway of sound through the ear is knowing which anatomical features come before when, and really understanding like the physiology behind when it reaches the cochlea. Um, I have here that, you know, there's going to be a lot of Oh my God, I keep going back, sorry. <laughs> um, we keep having fluid movement. We have these membranes within the cochlea, within the, um, the physiological kind of domain of the cochlea being the organ of cordae. And basically the shearing of the membranes is gonna cause hair cells to bend. Just like in the vestibular system, any type of movement we do is gonna cause hair cells to bend. So the bending of hair cells is kind of similar to when we talked about um, like, membrane potentials and receptor potentials changing and transduction, the end result is going to be that the sensory stimulus is going to then turn into a neurological stimulus and it's going to send an afferent signal to our brain in order for us to perceive it. So now we will go on to the next slide. So I have more of an analysis polling question to you. So if we can identify the anatomy involved in sensory physiology. If we understand you know, what receptors are, we can identify certain cells, certain structures. When we experience a sensation, and a sensation you know, basically comes from any type of environmental information, how are we able to perceive such information and recognize this sensation? How are we able to do that? So I'm gonna go ahead and open up polling question number five. This is more of an analysis question. Give you guys a few minutes to answer. Maybe about another minute. Couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. All right, so let's review that. So how, how do we perceive sensor information? And the answer would be C, so afferent signals to the brain. So we talked about afferent A arriving to the brain. Um, and of course, in order for us to recognize the sensor information, in order for us to perceive it, that perception happens within the brain. So of course, when we have an environmental stimulus um, that attracts to our you know, sensory receptors, whether we're eating some sort of food or smelling some sort of perfume or looking at um, a picture, any type of sensory information, in order for us to recognize what's going on and perceive it, um, that sensory stimulus will need to travel afferently to the brain. Absolutely. So, and that travels via sensory neurons. 
And we'll review, um, you know, when we get into muscular physiology, we'll start talking about like motor neurons and how those have a different function. But here in sensory physiology, we focus on sensory neurons because sensory travels afferent to the brain. So I wanna talk about vision real quick um, before we move on to our next topic. So similar to when we talked about the, um, like the auditory system, we talk about sound or like vibrations being sound and sound what we're hearing. In vision, what we see is light, you know, reflecting off of objects. So in order for us to see things, light is focused on um, the retina, which is a structure in the very back of our eye. And again, um, similar to all of sensory physiology, being able to know your anatomy and to identify certain structures, I recommend looking at the pictures in the lecture slides, which I believe are also the same pictures that are in the textbook, um, looking at lab protocols. And so really understanding, having a visual understanding of where this is occurring in the body really helps. So the retina is a structure in the very back of the eye where light must be focused on in order for us to see. And so when we, have focused light on the retina, we have this sensory signal. And this signal is going to be transduced. And we talked about that earlier. Um, and so I want, I want to ask you guys again, let's review kind of the definition of, of transduction. So feel free to unmute yourself or put yourself in the chat, specifically within the visual pathway. Um, you know, how does transduction occur? We have light reflecting on the retina and, and what does it mean to be transduced? Where is it gonna go after that? Where's that signal gonna end up? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Give you guys a minute to think. Think about when we talked about earlier, the definition of transduction. We talk about a change. So in terms of the visual system, like how, how can we explain transduction? We have light focusing on the retina. That's a, a sensory stimulus and it's, it's gonna be transduced into what? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be transduced into a neural signal into the brain. And our brain is going to be able to perceive such images. Absolutely. Um, so it's going to go into specifically the visual cortex of the brain. And so that's how we will be able to recognize what we are seeing. So I mentioned the retina. The retina is a very important anatomical structure because that is where um, that is where the sensory receptors are located. And in terms of the visual system, these sensory receptors are called photoreceptors, rods and cones. And so with sensory physiology, what I like to do, especially when I'm learning um, a new concept, like one of the five senses, I like to compare it to you know, what we already know. So we've reviewed taste and smell. So think about taste. Think about how the taste cells within the taste buds were the sensory receptor sites. Now in, in vision, we have photoreceptors within the retina, within the eye as the sensory receptors. So sometimes I like to make those connections so that I can better understand, you know, how does sensory physiology work? It starts with sensory receptors. So we have the rods and the cones. And so in order for us to, um, sense sight and perceive sight, um, there's going to be these photopigment molecules within rods and cones that are going to be chemically changed by the exposure of light, the environmental stimulus of light. And so rhodopsin is the um, photopigment molecule that is associated with rods and um, rods are associated with like black and white vision, seeing in the dark, night vision. And then photopsin is the photopigment molecule that um, is 
paired with cones and cones help us see color. In a way I like to remember it is um, like C color, C cones, um, color for cones. That's, that's how I like to remember it. So when we talk about the retina, you know, we're talking, talking about the, the sensory signals, the sensation that we have from light focusing on the retina. And um, as you guys perfectly you know, put it out that transduction is going to be this change of sensory information to then a neural information traveling to the brain in order to be perceived. Where is that going to go? It's going to go to the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is um, the retina is in the back of the eye and then the optic nerve follows. And so that optic nerve is going to carry, as we know, an afferent neurological signal to the brain, specifically our visual cortex, in order for us to perceive and recognize what we are seeing. So with um, vision, so we went over kind of like the pathway um, to vision. And so we understand that vision is focusing light on the retina. That is essential for us to be able to see. So there's different ways that this can happen um, depending on kind of where we are. If we need to see something that's really far away, if we need to see something that's more up close. And so how does this happen? We need to, our eyes need to accommodate for that. And there's gonna be this particular structure within the eye that needs to change its shape. What structure is that? Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. What structure needs to change in order to accommodate um, certain visual processes, depending on what we want to see. Feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. It's a particular structure within the eye that changes its shape. It would be the lens, no? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Maria. It would be the lens. So the lens is going to change its shape depending on um, how it, like, light needs to be focused on the retina in order for us to see clearly. So if we want to look at an object that's either really far away or really up close, our lens is going to change its shape to accommodate that and allow for that perfect reflection of light onto or focusing of light onto the retina. So there's, there's some rules here um, in how the lens is going to change its shape, how it's gonna um, move. So if we wanna see an object that's up close, our lens is gonna wanna be rounded. And how is that gonna happen physiologically? So within the eye, and again, this is where, um, you know, I would invite you to really review the lecture slides of um, eye anatomy and really see um, like different images and being able to label and understand, you know, what is what, understand the anatomy. So around the lens, and I have an image here um, from the University of Virginia, it's more of an animated image. So if you'd prefer to um, see like an actual eye image, I believe the lecture slides have some, but basically we have the lens and the lens is suspended um, via zonular fibers which are then connected to the ciliary muscle. And muscles move. So the ciliary muscle is either going to contract or relax. And that contraction or relaxation of the ciliary muscle is going to allow the lens to move. So if we want a rounded lens, how do, how do we achieve that? So if we contract our ciliary muscle, it allows everything else to be relaxed. So the zonular fibers are going to relax and the lens is going to kind of relax and that way it's going to be rounded. If we want to see something far, the lens needs to be flat. And that's how I like to remember like flat, far, um, or far, flat. Um, the lens needs to be flat. So it's going to be the opposite process. The ciliary muscle is going to relax. And once that's relaxed, the zonular fibers are going to contract and that is going to make that lens flat. So the way I would um, kind of recommend memorizing this is um, just writing out the steps, understanding that, you know, the first step would be understanding if I want to see something near, is the lens going to be flat or is it going to be round? And once I understand that, okay, the lens needs to be round, how does the lens become round? And then think about the zonular fibers, think about the ciliary muscle um, and how the way I like to remember is that, 
whatever the ciliary muscle does, the zonular fibers are going to do the opposite. So if you contract the ciliary muscle, it's going to relax the zonular fibers. If you relax the ciliary muscle, it's going to contract the zonular fibers. And it's those fibers themselves that are going to dictate the shape of the lens. So if you relax them, the lens is going to become rounded. If you contract them, the lens is going to flatten. So that's how accommodation works. All right, so that concludes um, just an overview of sensory physiology. So now let's move on to um, muscular physiology. So we'll talk about, you know, knowing, you know, what muscles are and what they do. So let's talk about uh, the anatomy of muscles. So there are um, three types of muscles. We have skeletal muscle, we have cardiac muscle, and we have smooth muscle. And I would like to ask you all, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat, um, which muscle type is, you know, contracts voluntarily, which is responsible for voluntary movement, and which is responsible for involuntary movement. Skeletal muscle is responsible for voluntary movement? Yes, absolutely. So then what would be responsible for involuntary movement? Um, the cardiac and smooth muscle? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Maria. Absolutely correct. So the skeletal muscle, and we talked a little bit about this when we were reviewing um, like the somatic nervous system and the parasympathetic, or excuse me, autonomic nervous system. Um, so some muscles move voluntarily, such as skeletal muscle, and then some are involuntary. So cardiac muscle, which is found in the heart, we cannot control, you know, whether or not our heart is beating, we can't control um, the movement of that muscle. And then smooth muscle is often found in like your digestive system, the, um, you know, the layers of your intestines, the, your blood vessels. And so we can't control those movements. So those are involuntary. And so what I want to focus on in this workshop is really diving into skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle anatomy and skeletal muscle um, contraction. And so that's just kind of like the um, anatomy of uh, muscles. And I want to ask you all one more question. We talked about involuntary versus voluntary. I want to ask another question about the anatomy. Which type of muscles are striated in appearance? If you look at like a microscopic picture of the muscle, um, and what, what kind of muscle is not striated? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Yes, so skeletal and cardiac muscle are striated, smooth is non-striated, absolutely correct. Um, so that's just kind of like another way to think about the difference between the two. So one is kind of like the difference of anatomy, like striated is the appearance, and then one is, the, is um, like a difference in more of the function, like does it function voluntarily? Does it function involuntarily? Um, so absolutely, thank you. So as far as the physiology of muscles, it's gonna be the opposite direction in which, you know, we, we just reviewed sensory physiology, right? We talked about how, you know, somewhere in our body, whether it's the taste receptors in our tongue, whether it's the olfactory neurons in our nose or nasal cavity, whether it is the photoreceptors in our eyes, these receptors in our body are gonna receive an, um, information. They're gonna transduce that information and they're gonna send an afferent signal to our brain in order to perceive that. So we have this pathway of like body to brain. In muscular physiology, and, and specifically we're, we're talking about skeletal muscle um, for this workshop, it's gonna be the opposite. We're gonna have neural activity, a neurological signal gonna reach out, it's going to reach our muscles. We're gonna have, um, again, you know, a, a type of membrane potential, um, depolarization, all, and we'll get into all that. We're gonna have a, a membrane potential in the muscle. And then what's our end goal um, as far as like muscle function is contraction. And so just like we talked about with sensory physiology, afferent signaling, body to brain, signals going to the brain. In muscle physiology, um, specifically skeletal muscle, it's the opposite. So 
neural activity to the body, it's going to be efferent, e-exiting. We are exiting the brain and reaching parts of our body. Um, so that's what we will be focusing on for the muscular system. So I, um, just to kind of like really emphasize that we're still, the nervous system's still involved just in a different way in efferent signaling. So there's these two vocabulary words that you should know, the neuromuscular junction and a motor unit. And so basically um, a neuromuscular junction is where a neuron, which is a nerve cell, and a muscle fiber, which is a muscle cell where they meet. And you'll hear the term a lot, innervation. It basically means, you know, where those meet and the neurons um, are, are placed, you know, on the muscle fiber. And so I talked a lot about sensory neurons and sensory physiology. And now I want to talk about motor neurons. So I want to ask you, and feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, you know, what's the difference between because they're both neurons, they're both nerve cells. What's the difference between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron? What's the difference between um, like its function? What does it aim to do? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Sensory neuron versus motor neuron. Think about afferent and efferent signaling. A few more seconds. Think about the difference. Efferent versus afferent, motor versus sensory. So the way that I like to remember the difference between sensory neurons and motor neurons are the types of signaling that they um, produce, afferent versus efferent. So with sensory neurons, as we talked about, it's going to um, sense something and send that signal to the brain, afferent signaling. Motor neurons are going to receive, um, you know, neurological kind of instructions, a stimulus, and it's going to send a signal from the brain to the body, efferent signaling. So those are often paired and that's how I like to remember it. And it's gonna stimulate an action potential in the muscle fiber. And then a motor unit is basically one motor neuron to many muscle fibers. And I have an image here um, that kind of shows the neuromuscular junction, how we have a neuron that is innervating skeletal muscles. So I have an identification polling question for you. And this is really, um, actually, I wanna go back to, oh God. Um, this image right here of skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle anatomy. The best advice I have as far as memorizing this is drawing it out, looking at images, being able to label. Um, Cause as you can see, there's different levels and it can get um, kind of confusing and complex, but I would like to point out that um, a couple key things here the tendon. So tendons basically attach muscles to bones. Now that we have our muscle, we think about, um, you know, if we think back to the very first um, like lecture, when we talk about um, the hierarchy of living things, right? We have cells to tissues to organs. So, you know, the muscle being a group of tissues are made up of muscle cells, also known as the muscle fiber. And then within the muscle cell, we're going to have these things called myofibrils. And then within the myofibrils, we're gonna have myofilaments. So a lot of it is just, I would say, memorize that order, look at images and understand where they are in relation to the entire muscle. So my question for you is, so a muscle cell is called a muscle fiber, just another name for it. Within muscle fibers, we have myofibrils and within myofibrils, we have myofilaments. What are those two? My question for you all is what are those two myofilaments? And I want you to be able to correctly identify which are the thick myofilaments and which are the thin. So I'm going to go ahead and open up that polling question. Polling number six. So identify those two myofibrils. <clears throat> 
give you a few more minutes. Couple more seconds. more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. All right, so identifying the myofilaments. So the answer was D. So the two filaments are called myosin and actin. And so myosin is a thick filament and actin is a thin filament. And so these myofilaments are responsible for the actual contraction of muscles. And we'll look more into that. So skeletal muscle function, um, you know, I, I compare it a lot or not compare, but um, I, you know, we talk about the difference between how, you know, sensory physiology works between, you know, this is like motor physiology. So, um, my question to you is, I talked a lot in sensory physiology about afferent signaling. In skeletal muscle function, what, what type of signaling is going on? Feel free to unmute yourself and put it in the chat. Think about the, the, what is the opposite of afferent signaling? Efferent signaling, perfect, you guys got it. So efferent signaling. And, and I'll ask you again, also put in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, if afferent signaling is traveling to the brain, what, what is efferent signaling? Or which direction is that going? From the brain to the muscles. Yeah. So from the brain outward to our motor systems. Absolutely. You guys got it. So an overview of um, skeletal muscle function is basically, we're gonna start with neural activity. There's gonna be an action potential in, in particular the motor neuron, and it's gonna reach um, our muscles. And so um, we're gonna have this membrane potential. And when we have that, you know, it's gonna lead to action potentials and then we're gonna have contraction. And so that's like base, that's very high level, just kind of one, two, three, the basic steps of that. But let's look a little bit deeper into that. So if we have an action potential in a motor neuron, that's our neural activity, um, and it reaches a muscle, what happens? So in particular, uh, we talked about the neuromuscular junction, and I want, um, feel free to unmute yourself and put, her in the, put it in the chat. Um, what is the neuromuscular junction? What's like a really basic definition of the neuromuscular junction? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. What is the neuromuscular junction? Synaptic contact between motor neuron and muscle fibers. Absolutely, absolutely correct. So um, when we have this motor neuron in contact with the muscle fiber, what's gonna happen as far as like the membrane potential and how like the physiology behind how we're gonna get to contraction is the role of acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is um, a neurotransmitter. There's more in-depth information about it in the lecture slide, so I would refer you to that if you have more questions about acetylcholine itself. But um, acetylcholine is going to be released from the neuron. It's going to bind to acetylcholine receptors in the muscle fiber, and then it's going to allow an action potential to occur. And eventually, we're going to have contraction. So that's like a really high-level overview. So I have a polling question for you. It's more of an identification question. Uh, we understand that muscle fibers contain myofibrils. Myofibrils contain myofilaments. And they're sectioned into, um, there's a certain word for that type of section. And if we're looking at images, particularly like my, or 
um, there may be some images in um, the lecture slides, but if we look at images of these sections, how can we identify? What can we see in the picture that helps us know like, okay, here are the sections. So this is kind of like a two part question. Um, what is it called and how can we notice it? How can we identify it? Give you a few minutes. few more minutes. Couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So this was kind of a trick question because they're all correct. <laughs> um, and I have an image here of, um, you know, this section of the myofilaments that they call the sarcomere. And so um, why are these all correct? Well, because, you know, we talk about myosin and actin being the myofilaments that are sectioned into sarcomeres. Myosin, um, are also referred to as thick filaments. Actin are also referred to as thin filaments. They're all myosins also referred to as I, I mean A bands, excuse me. Actin is referred to I bands, and then myosin referred to dark, actin referred to light. So these are all um, synonyms. So this is kind of a trick question. Um, and so we have here, we see in this image of the sarcomere, um, we have our thick filaments and our thin filaments overlapping. And so I have um, a polling question for you. It's more of a critical thinking question. We often hear like contracting a muscle and shortening a muscle interchangeably. We hear those terms used together a lot. And why is that? How would that make sense? I want you all to think about that. And I'll, I'll go ahead and release the polling question. This is eight. Let's think about why that is. Why is contracting a muscle um, also considered like shortening a muscle? Or like when you think about like flexing, you're shortening. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So the answer would be C and D. So the sarcomere is shortening. And as we talked about, the sarcomere is the um, like arrangement of the actin and myosin. And so within that, as it's shortening, the actin and myosin are moving closer together and there's more overlap. So with skeletal muscle contraction, I'll go through this pretty quickly um, since we're reaching the end, but again, um, for those of you who fill out the survey, this um, you will receive a copy of the PDF slides. And I also made this presentation based off of Dr. Anand's slides, so I would consult those as well. And if you have any particular questions, um, go to her office hours, read the textbook. So as far as skeletal muscle contraction, the actual contraction is also referred to as the sliding filament mechanism. And so with this sliding filament, there's going to be an overlap of myosin and actin that slide past each other. And so this is kind of an image of um, a drawing of what happens in the sarcomere when we're relaxed. We have myosin, 
we have actin, and we have these two things called tropomycin and troponin. And we'll look about, look closer into what that means in a minute. So when we contract, there's gonna be a few things that happen. We talked about, you know, neural activity to contraction. We're gonna have depolarization in a muscle fiber. And so what's gonna happen in particular is this um, signal, this depolarization, there's gonna be this role of calcium and calcium is gonna be released um, into the muscle and it's gonna to bind to, I have labeled here as this red dot troponin and troponin is attached to tropomycin. And so, you know, what is the role of tropomycin? Tropomycin is something that blocks actin so that it can't bind to myosin. And that binding is what we need in order for the sliding filament mechanism to occur so that we can contract. So when we have calcium and calcium binds to troponin, that's like a key. So when calcium binds to troponin, it's gonna move tropomycin out of the way. And so when tropomycin is out of the way, the myosin and the actin have that opportunity to um, link and then the sliding filament mechanism can happen. And how does that happen? It's called a power stroke. So the role of ATP, otherwise known as adenosine triphosphate or energy is gonna make that movement happen. And so how that movement happens is ATP is gonna release a um, phosphate group. It's be gonna become adenosine diphosphate. And so then we're gonna have this movement and I demonstrated it here with the arrows of the power stroke of the myosin head attached to the actin and then that sliding filament. And that movement itself, when we think about you know, that question about the sarcomere shortening, those filaments are gonna slide past each other, shortening the sarcomere. And we're gonna have this um, more overlap as you guys answered in the polling question. So that was basically um, like the contraction part of muscles. And so when we think about muscular physiology, you're gonna hear a lot um, excitation contraction coupling. And what I would love um, to ask you all, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. What does that mean? How is excitation contraction coupling different than the contraction itself? What's the key difference? What is it including that contraction? When we talk about contraction itself, we're not really focused on. Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. What is, what's the key thing here? So with excitation contraction coupling, the key thing um, is that we're looking at this from like the start and we're looking at uh, muscular physiology in terms of um, that it starts with neural activity. So we're not just focused on the contraction interval between the actin and the myosin and what's really happening on within the muscle cells. We're focusing on from step one, like how, how can our muscles contract? through neural signaling. And so um, there's many steps to excitation contraction coupling. What I would like to point out, and again, this is um, mentioned in detail a lot in the lecture and in the book, um, is that realize that it's gonna start with the neuron. It's gonna start with the nervous system. And as you guys um, pointed out perfectly earlier in the workshop that we're dealing with motor neurons, um, neurons that are responsible for movement. And so, any type of activation of the motor neuron. We talked about earlier, like the release of acetylcholine. And we talked about um, back when we were talking about the nervous system, you know, the somatic nervous system, how it's responsible for movement and in particular skeletal muscle, how that action at first, how that is gonna be the starting point to muscle contraction. And so there are a ton of steps in between um, I'm just paying attention to the time here. I'll go through them um, pretty quickly, but just so we know that the starting point would be like motor neural activity and the end point would be, as we just talked about, um, 
the contraction, the sliding of the filaments, and that itself is the contraction interval. So if we have neural activity in the motor neuron, a few things are going to happen. We can release acetylcholine. It's going to go into um, what is called the sarcolemma, which is an area within the muscle cells. We um, talked earlier about how the acetylcholine is going to bind to the muscle. We're going to have this depolarization, these action potentials um, down the transverse tubules. And I'll project an image of these in a moment. We talked about the role of calcium, how calcium is like the key to contraction. And why is that? I talked about it earlier and, and feel free, I wanna ask you, you know, what, what is so special about calcium that it is so essential for muscle contraction? What does it do in particular? Where does it bind to? And why, why is that important? What does it do? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. It binds to troponin C. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So um, troponin is binded to, or it's found on tropomyosin. And tropomyosin, as we talked about, blocks the actin and myosin binding sites. So when calcium binds to troponin, what, it, what does that do? What does that do to tropomyosin in particular? Someone tell me that. Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. What does it do to tropomyosin? It moves so that the actin head can bind to the site. Yes, absolutely. I would just add that it binds to um, the myosin head site. So absolutely. So tropomyosin is going to move out of the way. It's going to allow actin and myosin to then bind together. And that's going to allow us to then, you know, we talked about the role of ATP and the power stroke, allowing those to slide past each other, shortening the sarcomere, aka muscle contraction. We talked a little bit about that in our critical thinking question of why like shortening and contracting are also, um, are often used like interchangeably. So that's just very high level excitation, contraction, coupling, um, just knowing that I'm thinking in terms of, you know, like a test question, really paying attention to what the question is asking. Is it just asking for you to talk about the contraction interval and the sliding filament mechanism? Or is it really asking you questions about excitation contraction coupling? Is it really gonna want you to really talk about and identify what's going on neurologically? Um, and so what's in, an important kind of vocabulary word is um, the term latency period. And it's, so it's the time in between an action potential and contraction. So it's that time in between like what's happening neurologically, that stimulus, and what's happening um, like somatically within our muscles, within our body. So that's uh, just kind of an overview of excitation, contraction, coupling. And so here I mentioned um, in this, and it talks about it in lecture two, like terms like sarcolemma, transverse tubules. This is an image just to kind of guide um, your understanding of where this is happening. As we can see, it's occurring, um, like these structures are found like along myofibrils, or I'm sorry, myofilaments. So again, as I said earlier, I would recommend um, really looking at images, looking at the images in the slides, looking at the images in the textbook and really being able to identify what is what. So I recommend for studying muscular physiology before jumping into like the physiology behind it and understanding all the processes, make sure you know how to identify the structures because there'll be um, questions on the test that, you know, will mention the word like myofilament actin, myosin, and you need to know, um, like, what is that? Where is it in terms of muscle physiology? So that would be my recommendation as far, and, and same with sensory physiology. The nervous system is a little different um, in that I would recommend, um, like we talked about writing out the chart of the different divisions and writing down the definition. So just a lot of repetition, a lot of writing, a lot of labeling, that would be my advice. So that is all I have for you. We have a few more minutes. Um, well, first I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, 
and that this workshop was an overview of the key concepts that um, can guide your studying for the lecture two exam. Some tips I have for you for success on the lecture two exam is, um, you know, with physiology, there's a lot of sequences, a lot of steps, um, and just writing out like one through five, one through 10, and being able to know what comes next in a sequence is really helpful. Uh, I mentioned earlier, really knowing your anatomy, looking at pictures, being able to label them, that's really gonna help when you are actually writing out your sequences. It's really gonna help you understand your vocabulary and you get to put two and two together. Um, a lot of these processes require, you know, not only are you listing out a lot of steps, but it requires like a lot of explanation. Like we, you know, explained as a group why calcium is so important to muscle contraction. We understood, you know, where it comes into play with excitation contraction coupling, like where it's released, when it's released, but also like why that's important. And so I always recommend like practice explaining it to a friend or a family member. The best way to learn is to teach. So I always advocate for that as well. And so overall with anything that's highly complex, which is all of physiology um, can be very complex. It's okay to break up sequences into chunks. Like for example, in this workshop, I demonstrated how um, like we reviewed muscle contraction itself before we went over excitation contraction coupling. If you would like to do it that way and really um, kind of look at each individual or like smaller processes and then look at the big picture, that's okay as well. Just remember to know all the steps and that goes with writing out sequences. So that is my advice to you. Um, thank you all for coming. And this is um, flyers of my tutoring hours. I am not the only bio 60, 66 tutor, excuse me. Um, I'm not the only bio 66 tutor. We also have Jason, he's wonderful. And I have his um, information as well. I believe these flyers are also on your Canvas page. Um, and so feel free to book an appointment through Spartan Connect. And um, I mentioned earlier, oh, thank you guys. I mentioned earlier that um, this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. The link is in the chat. Thank you, Maya. And then the link is also, the link for the survey is also in the chat as well. I'm gonna go ahead and...